Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is a pro revenge story. Two years ago, a new family moved into our quiet little neighborhood and began their reign of terror. We've lived here for over 20 years, and except for these past two years, it's been wonderful. I love our neighbors, except this family. This family just sucks. I'm not even sure where to begin. They are loud, they are dirty, they are obnoxious, their dog barks at all hours, they constantly yell at each other, they throw parties well into the night, they steal my older neighbor's paper, they actually train their Rottweiler to fetch the neighbor's paper, impressive but wrong. They throw their dog's poo into other yards. Ah, so much. They even cut my 80-something-year-old neighbor's prized roses for themselves. Who does that? There are about a hundred issues I could write about in how we've all dealt with them, but this past weekend was my own glorious take on it all. Oh, and yes, we tried talking to them, we tried inviting them over, we've done nice things for them, and all we've expected is that they act like decent neighbors. That's never happened. In our neighborhood, parking is scarce. Most of these homes are classic 1950s with single-lane driveways, and parking is limited even on the streets. There's a busy road a few blocks away that has a great nightlife and popular restaurants, which means that at times, especially on the weekends, the street can fill up. This family has four drivers and five vehicles with only enough space for two in their driveway at a time. Constantly, they would park and leave their vehicles for days and sometimes weeks in front of others' homes, sometimes leaving their driveway empty for no reason with all of their cars parked on the road. I kind of believe that in itself isn't that big of a deal except for how and when they would do it. They were intentional about it all would do so to try to cause the most grief with everyone, and this went on for months, a complete duck you to everyone. After months of this and no one retaliating or giving them the satisfaction of how pissed we all are, they started parking deliberately in ways to make it difficult to get out of our driveways. I had to have my husband come out most mornings to guide me so I wouldn't hit their car as I backed out of my own driveway. There were also times where they squeezed my neighbor's car on the street to where they couldn't get out. Finally, an older retired neighbor goes down to the city police station and inquires about what to do. They found a code or law stating that so much space from the sides of driveways and yada 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 is required. So we come home one night to freshly painted yellow curbs outlining every house surrounding this one. A few weeks ago, my husband's car breaks down and he has to get towed. On his way back, he starts talking with the tow truck driver about these a-hole neighbors and their cars. He tells my husband that if these cars are parking illegally, we should call the non-emergency line, and if they receive a ticket, to call him, and he can tow them at the owner's expense. It's the law. My husband and he keep talking and even meet up for a beer a few nights later. They are big fans of the Blazers' Rip City. He's a real good guy. About a month ago, we met a couple in our fair city. And it just so happens that the husband is an officer. We were already planning on meeting that Friday night, and when we met, I brought up the a-hole neighbors and their parking. He says that he'll drive through on his shift if he gets time, and if he sees them parked in the yellow, he has no problem ticketing them. Great. He also gets some of his friends to check it out when they have time too. Fantastic. We've been calling almost daily at this point about their cars parked illegally, but nothing was happening. That Saturday night, the teenage son throws a party, and everyone, I mean every single one of their guests and them, parked in the yellow of someone's driveway or blocked someone out altogether. Obviously, the little crap told all of his friends to block our driveways or block our cars in. I sent a text to our officer friend who told me to call the non-emergency line, and he'd be the one to look into it. But I'm scheming bigger. I call up the tow truck driver and tell him that there are at least 15 cars parked illegally, and all are about to receive parking tickets for blocking driveways and cars. I let him know we are friends with an officer and he and I scheme a little further. We get a solid plan. I call our officer friend back and tell him our plan, and I also mention that the party is likely going to be filled with underage drinkers. Now, I hate busting parties, but I make exceptions for little craps and especially little underage drinking and driving craps. He and I finalize the plan. Here's how it all went down. The officer and three of his partners go through the neighborhood sighting all of the cars. Meanwhile, our tow truck driver friend has assembled a group of drivers in the nearby grocery store parking lot. My husband and I make an anonymous call about a possible underage party. 
The tow truck drivers start at the ends of our street, grabbing the cars as quickly as possible. A few alarms here and there, but no way could they hear it in the party. When they approach the house, my husband makes an anonymous call about an underage party in our neighborhood. Conveniently, our officer friend just so happens to still be in the neighborhood, so he and his partner go over to the house to check on it. As they knock on the door, lights go out, music shuts off, and the house goes quiet. At this moment, the tow trucks come in and are now towing the remaining five cars right from in front of their home. I just wish I could see the kids' faces inside as they are all having a dilemma about what to do. Do they go out and bust themselves for underage drinking and try to stop their cars from being towed? Or do they just sit and bite the bullet and watch $250 plus go down the drain? On Sunday, they had three cars return from being towed and all three are parked just shy of the yellow lines. I'll call this a win. My husband and a couple of neighbors also spent Sunday putting up some new cameras. They were all very giddy and loud about it all. Something about all the lights and police on Saturday made them nervous. The next one is an entitled people story. When my husband and I moved into our dream home, we were ecstatic. Our beautiful property had a fabulous pool that we loved to enjoy, but our neighbor Becky believed that she had the right to use it as well. Despite our refusal, she continued to push and even called the cops on us when we denied her request. Our home was located just in front of a neighborhood governed by an HOA, and our yard led directly to a sidewalk that ran parallel to the eastern portion of our property. Becky was one of the residents of the neighborhood to the south of our house and claimed to be good friends with the previous owners. When we first met her, she was cordial, but it wasn't long before her true intentions became apparent. Becky started making comments about how her old friends had let her and her family use the pool in the past, and how awesome they were for doing so. She even went as far as wearing a bathing suit underneath her dress and attempting to barge into our yard uninvited. We told her that we were only using the pool for a few laps and would be cooking dinner soon, but she laughed and tried to enter our yard anyway. Eventually, my husband managed to get the point across that we didn't want her there, but it didn't stop there. Becky and her sons would often show up unannounced, asking to use the pool or bringing their friends over to use it, it was getting out of hand and we knew we needed to take action. One day, while we were at work, Becky and her son snuck into our yard and used the pool without permission. We were furious but we didn't want to escalate the situation. However, when we came home to find that they had left beer cans and trash all over our yard, we knew we had to do something. We decided to set up security cameras around our property to catch them in the act. It wasn't long before we had footage of them trespassing on our property and using the pool without our consent. We even had footage of Becky pouring beer into the pool. We took the footage to the HOA, hoping that they would put a stop to Becky's behavior. But instead, they accused us of violating the neighborhood's rules by not allowing the pool to be used by the community. We were shocked and frustrated by their response. Despite their accusations, we refused to give in to Becky's demands. We had worked hard to afford our dream home and wanted to enjoy it without feeling violated. Becky didn't stop, though. She continued to harass us, even going as far as filing a complaint with the police. We were devastated by the situation and didn't know what to do. We consulted with a lawyer, but the legal battle was going to be long and expensive. However, fate seemed to be on our side when one night we heard a loud commotion coming from Becky's house. We went outside to investigate and saw that her sons were throwing a wild party, with dozens of teenagers drinking and smoking in the yard. We knew we had to act fast. We called the police and waited for them to arrive. When the police showed up, they found drugs and alcohol on the premises, leading to the arrest of Becky's sons and several other minors. Becky was also arrested for contributing to the delinquency of minors. It was a satisfying end to our ordeal, and we finally felt like we could enjoy our home without fear of intrusion. Update. Since the incident, we have been much more cautious about who we let onto our property. We have also taken steps to improve our home security, and have continued to advocate for ourselves and our property rights. We have also become more involved in the HOA, attending meetings and voicing our concerns. We found out that Becky had a history of entitlement and had caused issues for other neighbors as well. We decided to work with other concerned neighbors to hold the HOA accountable for its actions and ensure that our community was a safe and respectful place to live. 
We established a neighborhood watch program and encouraged others to report any suspicious behavior. To our surprise, the HOA responded positively to our efforts and implemented new policies to prevent future intrusions on private property. They also began to take our concerns more seriously and addressed the issue of entitlement within the community. The next one is a petty revenge story. My stepmom was a nasty woman to grow up with. She was mean, vindictive, and had an inferiority complex that she used to attack anyone who was doing well, especially those doing better than her. My dad spent my childhood over the road and my mom was in and out of inpatient facilities until she passed, so a lot of my time was spent with her being my only available caregiver slash guardian. I won't bullcrap and say I was perfect, but I wasn't bad. I was a good student involved in community and school activities, and as soon as I could work, I got a job. My biggest issue was that I often took an attitude with her and her family, all of whom sucked to be near. These people have been in my life since I was four, and I am now in my late twenties, and not one of them was ever supportive or kind. I had aspirations to go to school and be a psychologist, a teacher, a therapist, a veterinarian. Honestly, I think I just liked the structure school offered and wanted to continue with it after graduation, but as soon as I was handed my diploma, my stepmom handed me a notice to vacate the property. Less than a month later, I was gone. To be fair to him, my father did try to intervene and prevent the eviction since it was his home, but she was the main occupant in the house, and we were informed by a local cop that she could, in fact, remove me from the home and press trespassing charges if I ever came back. To this day, I think he was likely full of crap but didn't want to deal with it. So I was 18, homeless, and supposed to start college a few months later, and I had chosen a local school and rejected better scholarships so I could stay home and save money on housing. I found a place with a man that became my best friend, and I did try to attend school, but honestly, it just didn't feel right anymore. Between full-time work just to scrape by and the mental health issues that arose in the aftermath, I couldn't continue and dropped out. My dad was unable to offer much support, and most of my family never cared to intervene since she had convinced the majority of them that I had chosen basically to go NC with them. She would call and gloat about how hard the real world is, make snide comments about my dying mother, and in the same breath offer sympathy and support if I came back home. At holiday dinners, she would tell everyone I was the first psychologist she'd ever seen working the till at McDonald's, and if I defended myself, I would be chastised for not taking a joke. It was humiliating, and after a few years, I realized I could block her, and she couldn't do anything about it, so I did. My life did turn around, I work as a pastry chef in a bakery I adore and would love to buy someday if the owner would let me when he retires. It's not a life I ever imagined for myself, but it's a good one that I share with my fiancé, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. In the past two years I resumed contact with my dad and as a result his wife again. He's still a doormat and she's still an idiot, but she's not picking on a little girl anymore and I bite back now. I've also managed to contact my mom's family who had been estranged from her for decades before she died, and met people who could have truly loved me if they had known I existed. Dad's family is kept at arm's length, but I finally have a family that I can talk about when my friends are discussing holiday plans, and that's all I ever wanted. Doing what I do for a living, I always show off a bit at family gatherings, and I've often made custom cakes for relatives when asked. Boundaries have been established, and after the first cousin who tried pushing them found herself without a cake on her son's birthday, they are respected. Stepmom hates my job. She hates that I'm happy, that I don't care if I'm a bit plump, that I'm engaged, and she's not allowed near the wedding. She hates that I'm good at what I do, and try as she might, the only thing she can ever insult is the fondant. Which, fair. I don't care for it either. At my dad's birthday party last month, I baked a lovely three-tier red velvet cake for him and provided numerous pastries as well as a cookie buffet. My boss is a godsend for letting me use his industrial kitchen to make it all. The day of, all stepmom could say was my cake tasted like a box mix, and that was it. Two decades of abuse, and I was finally done trying. I spent days making everything I provided, all free of charge, and she compared my labor and knowledge to ducking Betty Crocker. No shame to anyone who bakes likes Betty or any other boxed mix, but it's like comparing fast food to your cooking, and the fast food being preferred. A total slap in the face to the hours of labor and effort, and years spent honing and perfecting recipes. She asked me at the beginning of February to bake her cake for her 50th, 
No other details other than she didn't want red velvet, and it was for 100 people. I agreed. I stocked up on Duncan Hines and canned frosting, slapped the frosting on top of crappity sheet cakes a day before, and didn't bother decorating any of them. Stepmom was livid. I ruined her birthday, embarrassed her in front of her friends and family. How could I be so callous, etc.? I just told her she compared my cake at Dad's party to Betty Crocker, so she must prefer low-effort cakes. I left shortly after she started crying. Apparently, she had planned on Instagramming the party and had planned on my normal quality of care for my desserts. Dad didn't care. He just said it was best if I'm not around her for a bit and we meet up somewhere other than his house. I don't want to be near her again and I hope her family choked on that dry-ass cake. The next one is an entitled people story. I was traveling by myself for the first time and I'm only 18. I booked the aisle seat specifically because I didn't want to be in the middle of two strangers. It would make me very uncomfortable and conscious. I paid extra for the seat for this reason. When I got to my seat, there was a middle-aged man around 30, 40 years old in my seat. Normally I'm very socially anxious and this time even more so as it was my first time alone, but there was no way I was going to sit between two random strangers. So I did what anybody would do and informed him that this was my seat and showed him my boarding pass. He admitted it wasn't his seat but that his co-worker was in the seat next to him on the next row and he wanted to be with him. He offered me his seat which he said was the window seat. The window seat is my favorite but cost more. So in my head I was getting a good deal so I happily took it. I basically hopped, jumped, and skipped to take the seat and settled down happily. That was until another man, B, came and told me that I was in his seat. So I looked at A, expecting him to pull out his ticket showing I was in his seat. But instead this man looks at me sheepishly and says that his seat is actually the middle seat. He hoped that the seat was empty, but he was wrong. He actually expected me to be okay with sitting in the middle. At this point I'm raging a little. I might be socially anxious, but I'm not a pushover. I told him no, I only agreed because he said his seat was the window seat, and that he needs to move to his seat or I will call the crew to sort this out. At this point, he just kept parroting the words, My co-worker is here, I want to sit next to him. Maybe you can be a sweet little girl and sit in the middle just this one time. The moment he said that, I realized I only had to deal with this because I was young and a woman, so now I'm livid and immediately call for the crew after repeatedly saying no because, again, I paid extra for the seat. Even when the crew came to sort it out, he wasn't listening. He kept telling them that there wasn't any issue and that this was just a small disagreement that could be sorted between us. When I informed them what was happening and they requested him to move, he just kept saying, Maybe you can be nice. Can you please do me this favor? and that immediately switched to, you know you should respect your elders. Why do you need the aisle seat? You can easily fit in the middle. Turns out the other person wasn't even his co-worker. He was a random person who had his earphones in, completely unaware of the situation until it was escalated. At this point, I could not believe the entitlement. I told him I paid extra for the seat, and if he wanted the seat, Maybe he should have paid the extra fees, and since he didn't and I did, I was going to sit in the seat I paid for and he can deal with it. Thankfully, the crew basically forced him out of my seat and into his with the threat of him being removed from the aircraft. The entire time he kept looking at me saltily and muttering under his breath on how the youth of today are so disrespectful. They should give priority to older passengers and the men, which I, of course, ignored. It was even funnier when he wanted the non-veg meal and had to get the veg one because I got the last one. He threw a fit about this as well, but I pre-ordered my meal while he didn't, so I was offered it first. At this point, the crew was getting sick of him, and so they told him they could give him an aisle seat in a row that was behind us. He obviously jumped at this opportunity. The crew switched him out for a nice lady. Turns out he got the very last row near the lavatory, which is why the lady was happy to switch in the first place. After that ordeal, I had a great flight, and the crew was really nice to me. When we landed, the lady who switched seats with the man thanked me for standing up to him and said that it was refreshing to see someone who won't tolerate such behavior. It made me feel good to know that I did the right thing and that lady had my back. From now on, I won't be afraid to stand up for myself, even if I'm alone. The next one is an entitled parent story. I have a brother-in-law, let's call him Bill. He is 26 years old, a two-time university dropout, and has never worked, not even a summer job. He is an okay lad as a person, just a little bit Kevin. 
I work in a large company and I have the ability to create positions, hire and fire within my department. One day, my parents-in-law asked me if I could find some work for Billy. Although we did not need anybody in my department for additional unskilled labor, I went through hoops and corporate gymnastics for three weeks to create a position for him and justify it to my superiors. I had to explain why we needed this position and why we couldn't create a public job offer for it. I think I blew all my favors and definitely owe some now. Finally, the day came when I received a contract for him from HR. He was supposed to be a back office administrator or, in human language, a clerk. The salary was set a tiny bit under the national median for this position, but I simply couldn't justify more. This weekend, I brought the contract to Billy, who lives with his parents, and presented it to him. Here's how it went. For perspective, 1,300 euros net is the average living cost for a single person outside of city centers. Me. And here is your salary, the bottom line, which shows what will appear on your bank account after tax and social security. Billy. 1,300 euros is not much, is it? Me. It is an entry position, and your job is really just pulling from the archive or archiving with occasional data entry. But see here, I pointed at benefits each year, you are eligible for a certain salary increase. Billy. I thought I would become your partner or something like that. Me. Um, well, you're going to be something like my assistant. When I need something, I will tell the back office manager, and she might assign it to you. His father joined in. Father. What? You are making my son your errand boy, and for such a pittance, this is humiliating. Me. Um, frankly, he does not have... He interrupted me. Father. Everybody knows that you managers are sitting there all day doing nothing, so why can't my son? Me. Listen, I cannot make him a project manager in an engineering company. If it's about money, I can put in a word for him in the assembly hall. They always want people, and the salary is way higher, but it is really hard work. Father. Grease monkey? Like some Eastern European immigrant? Me. Uh, that's actually also quite a qualified worker position. I meant like an assembly worker on belts. Hard job, but as I said, better salary, including paid overtime, with more vacation than I have, and actually a pretty decent chance of promotion. Father. Haha, ha, why don't you put him in a coal mine right away then? Or better, make him... Me. We are done here. Billy... If you do not come tomorrow at 7 a.m. to my office, I will put this offer to the Ministry of Labor for active job seekers. And good luck with your CV. Father. And this married my daughter? Me. Door slam topics he called afterwards with my wife. Your husband thinks so little of us that he wanted your brother to be his lackey for a grand a month. Now I am happy you do not have kids yet. He would probably put them on a farm field. If he abuses you, let me know. I will knock his teeth out. Conclusion. Billy came today at 7 a.m. to my office to see those assembly belts despite the wishes of his father, but with encouragement from his sister, my wife. I am glad I could vent my frustration and anger with you here, dear Redditors, and at the same time amuse you. May your poop scrolling at work be fruitful. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.